next two programs, Saturday Sport, and that was the week that was. Leading 60 minutes of top sport tonight with our cameras covering all the thrills from Perth, London and Wolverhampton. Now three gold medals came England's way on the final day of the Empire and Commonwealth Games. And later on in the program we'll be showing the latest film that we've received from our team in Perth. But first it's soccer and a visit to the packed terraces at White Hart Lane where Spurs were at home to Everton. Over 400,000 pounds worth of footballing talent was on view and thousands of people were locked out of the ground long before the start of this eagerly awaited duel between the country's best attack and the country's best defence. Spurs versus Everton. It's obviously a packed house here at White Hart Lane for this great match of the day between Spurs and Everton. Spurs with two men out now. Medwin we knew was going to be out so Clayton is playing his first game the season at outside right but now Johnny White was taken ill during the night with flu and he's out of the side so Markey comes in and Mackay moves to the forward line bad blow that for Spurs now we could look over to the other side the pitch in the dark shirts Everton led of course by their little mascots standing next to Roy Vernon they've got their full side out they've decided to keep Parker at right back Having won the toss, it's Everton to kick off. And away they go, and Everton trying to... No, the kickoff's got to be retaken. Spurs inside the centre circle before the whistle went. So it's Everton who kick off at the second attempt. Trying to prove that their form in London is all wrong. They've made two visits to London this season. Lost them both, once at Fulham, once at Lake Orient. Nevertheless, Everton... Uh, extremely good away record this season. They won at Burnley, won at Wolves, won at Nottingham Forest, at Bolton and Manchester United. You can't get it much better than that. Uh, it's Everton moving forward on the attack uh, to Harris and Harris coming through for Everton now and it's Baker fortunately for Spurs. And Baker once again the saviour of Tottenham under pressure in these. this opening minute now Mackay playing an inside right up it comes now with the outside left, Neil. Both these teams including, include 12 internationals between them, six on each side. Both teams amassed at an almost fantastic expenditure of something like 450,000 pounds. Now it's Stevens for Everton, Stevens for Young. Ball playing centre forward of Everton into Stevens now a chance for Everton but Stevens well won. Hurt in that 
tussle. He looks hurt on his goal line. He got banged, but he'll be all right, I think. Now Greaves. And Harris, who just stopped Greaves going through for the shot then. Up now with Stevens. Bingham starting to race into the middle, but Norman there to perform the interception. Now Henry goes Spurs. And now Richard Spurs. So many of the defenders worried into making careless clearances. Clayton into Greaves. Back now with Baker to Mackay. Now with Greaves and Blanchfly is beginning to move up for the first time in the match. As a lovely chip through for Jones. And if he only had hit that first time, it would have been one. A lovely move by Greaves. Up comes Blanchfly for Spurs now. Jones on his left. Here comes Jones. And the well-packed, well-drilled Leverton defence again. Almost an Italian-style defence Everton have got. Back it comes with Vernon. Vernon finding Veal. Harris has now moved up with the Everton attack to give them six forwards. And Vernon just taking two fouls. Makaya's dropped back for Spurs. Out of Greaves. Clayton moving forward on the right wing. There's Clayton, number seven. Allen in the middle. So too is Jones, but... Everton have got the weight of numbers in defence. Goal kick. Goal kick to Everton. Certainly this Everton defence is looking a first-class organisation. Here it is under the test again. The two, four, six of them back again. Now Greaves, and not often do we see Greaves use his head. Well, not to head the ball anyway. Not a good kick by West that time, putting Spurs in possession. Spurs now moving forward once again. Blanchflow with that long run, finding Greaves. Greaves working very hard indeed, trying to work out a shot. He's hit the ball! Now Clayton, Markey, out with Clayton and Everton, really piling back in defence now. They've got eight men back there as Allen moves forward. That's now the chance to put Spurs back on the attack. Everton coming up to try and play the offside game without success, and that's the goal. That's Parker for Everton. Now Gabriel. Gabriel up to Stevens. So are Everton going to do it? Just on the stroke of half time. Now it's Bingham. And that was almost an own goal by Morris Norman. And it's a corner. There's 30 seconds left for play in this first half. Corner for Everton. So Spurs are now packing their goal. They've got nine men back, but the whistle is gone for half time with the score sheet blank. And now the floodlights are on for the second half. It's Spurs to kick off. No goals. Lots of thrills, lots of good football, but so far in the first half, the defense is just that we bit too strong for the attacks. Let's see whether we've got the same story in this second half. The crowd, incidentally, a big one of 60,630 people. challenge and that's what's happening so often in this game. Wingman and inside forwards are all coming back to do their stint in defence, making it almost impossible for a text to get through. Notice over on the far side, Peter Baker is even calling Clayton back to the Spurs defence now to reinforce it as Everton start their attack from this throw in. Bingham and the tall Morris Norman is commanding as the bone is at the other end. That's Greaves. Falling back into their defensive positions now. That's click, click to Greaves, and up comes Baker. 
Still this girl looking very remote. Now Greaves, can Greaves get a long one in? That's the Jimmy Lowe Greaves shot, but it's not far away. Greaves has had one near miss and one hit crossbar in this match. Greaves darting down the middle quickly, but it's a lofted pass which is not much good to Greaves. And a foul, the linesman is flagging for push in the back by Clayton on Megan. Free kick to Everton. right at the end of the game. Now a chance for Spurs to relieve it. No foul. Stevens got the ball that time. Now it's Jones for Spurs. And Jones running into trouble, so now Vernon. By my watch, neither side now has time to get the ball in the net. Just 15 seconds, but don't left but don't forget we've got injury trying to be added on and looks a nasty one and it's a free kick to Spurs now we're really in the dying seconds it's almost all over look at Alan de Mackay but Gabriel there once again for Everton so it must be all over now Young, feel out to Bingham, now to Young, by my watch we played 30 seconds over the 90 minutes, now Allen, has he got time to snatch a sensational winner, now to Clayton, it's got to be a quick centre, and the bone getting up to a fantastic height. Field. And Field showing a fantastic turn of speed. Another look at his watch by Mr. Rhodes of York, the referee. And there goes the whistle. This splendid game has ended, no score, and for the first time this season, Tottenham Hotspur have been kept goalless by a superb Everton defence. No score, a very fair result, and that draw keeps Everton on top of the first division. They're two points ahead of Spurs, Burnley are third, another point behind.
Now, the Empire and Commonwealth Games ended in Perth today with England winning three more gold medals. Our sprinters, Peter Radford, Len Carter, Alf Meakin and David Jones made up for our earlier track disappointments when they won the men's four times 110 yards relay, with Jones just pipping men's of Ghana. Both teams clocked 40.6 seconds, a new game's record. Now, Howard Payne won the hammer with a throw of 202 feet, three inches and a fantastic sprint after the 120 mile road race gave cyclist Wesley Mason the gold. And now let's look back to last Thursday, when England had their greatest day, winning seven golds, four silver and seven bronze medals. The hero on this day was Brian Kilby, the Coventry draftsman, who ran the fastest games marathon against the wind and the rain. He thus became the first man to win both the European and Empire marathons. We now salute him in our Perth reports as David Coleman describes the start of the marathon. The runners lining up for the start of the marathon. Uh, the race over, bit, over which there's been so much controversy over the starting time. It was thought that the excessive heat here at Perth would uh, possibly produce a disaster of the magnitude of uh, Jim Peters' uh, run in Vancouver in 1954. But in fact, uh, the weather couldn't be better for a marathon, and it's quite cool. Number 11 there in the centre of the picture, the fantastic Bruce Kidd of Canada. Kidd already the six miles champion in this race. Right on the inside is the European champion, Brian Kilby from uh, England. Also running is Dave Power, Australia, the holder of the title. He won it at uh, Cardiff, Power wearing number three. Straight in the lead goes number 12, Yusuf at Pakistan. The runners will go round the track once and then leave by the tunnel on their journey of 26 miles, 385 yards. Very strong wind blowing, and the leader on this first lap, Yusuf of Pakistan. The English runners are Brian Kilby, uh, Martin Hyman, uh, Mel Batty, and Peter Wilkinson. From Wales is John Merriman, and from Scotland, Alistair Wood, the man who was fourth in Belgrade in the European Championship. The order then, in the back straight, Yusuf of Pakistan leading, Peter Wilson in second place from England. Uh, Brian Kilby from England in third place. I think the English runners were praying for these kind of conditions after the temperature just uh, five or six days ago, being well over, over the century. In fact, it's worked out very well for them. Yusuf of Pakistan getting a special hand from the crowd. Peter Wilkinson in second place for England. Third is Brian Kilby for England. Fourth from Australia, Keith Olorenshaw. Tucked in the bunch, Mel Batty. And Alastair Wood. And right at the back is the usual slow starter, Martin Hyman. Uh, better known as a six-miler, of course, and running in his first marathon. So away they go now on their long, long journey. 26 miles, 385 yards. Yusuf, first out of the stadium. Brian Kilby and Peter Wilkinson absolutely together and way, way at the back at the moment. Martin Hyman, the man who likes to run at an even pace and who's certainly got not going to be tempted into going away too quickly. We come now to the first track final on Thursday's uh, day of track and field events. And just as the runners come out onto their marks, a tremendous rainstorm sweeping the stadium, the first we've seen in Perth, and a very strong wind blowing right across the field. The lineup on the inside for Rhodesia Smith. In lane two, the 100 yards champion, Anteo of Kenya. In lane three, Okanti of Ghana. In lane four, David Jones of England. In lane five, Mike Cleary, Australia. And lane six, Johan Dupriest of Rhodesia. David Jones, we feel, is on the heat times, has just got a chance of getting a medal. David's not been in his best form this season. One's got to really admire the way he fights. He's really got down to it out here in Australia. And uh, conditions, I would say, today are right in his favour, because he's very strong indeed, and uh, this wind isn't likely to upset him uh, as much as the other runners. But I think the man who must be regarded as favourite, and a clear favourite too, of course, is uh, Anteo in lane two but it's just possible that David Jones could get in the medals. 
The line of men from the inside, Smith, Rhodesia, lane two, and Teo of Kenya, lane three, Jones, uh, Canty rather of Ghana, lane four, Jones of England, lane five, Clary, Australia, lane six, Dupreece, Rhodesia. The 2.20 yards final. Away smoothly, first time David Jones got a good start, but so did Akanti of Ghana, and look at Anteo in lane two. He's pulling them right back on the stack, and he must be yards clear of the car. The man for Jones is going well too. Jones right in the centre, Anteo leading. On the near side, Dupreece and Jones fighting his way down the straight, and he's got to get the silver with a bit of luck. Anteo streaking home, way ahead, and a wonderful run by David Jones in second place. First, Anteo, second Jones, and third, Dupreece of Rhodesia. The second gold medal for... A sprinter from Mombasa being congratulated there by the bronze medal winner Dupree, and there is David Jones. Well, certainly David came over here without a great deal of hope, possibly, of getting the medal, but he ran extremely well there to take the silver. David Jones from Woodford Green, 22 years old, no doubt extremely pleased with himself because he's really worked hard to do it. And there, the official result, the winner, Anteo of Kenya, 21.1. That's a measure of how bad conditions are. Second, David Jones of England, 21.5. And the bronze medalist, Dupreez of Rhodesia, 21.6. The first heat of the 80 metres hurdles from the far side in lane one, Hart of Ghana. Lane two, Francis Slarp of England. Lane three, McIntosh of New Zealand. Lane four, Betty Moore of England. Lane 5, Evans of Australia, and on the near side in lane 6, Smith of Jamaica. The first three qualify for the final. Betty Moore, the girl to watch in lane 4, a member of Salford Harriers. She is, in fact, an Australian who's been living in England for about five years. Betty Moore was away well. The New, New Zealand girl, McIntosh, had a beautiful start, so did Hart of Ghana. But it's McIntosh, New Zealand leading. Betty Moore catching up after that bad start. She's got a lot to do. Very close thing indeed for first place. The New Zealand girl may just have held on, but it doesn't really matter. McIntosh qualified, and so did uh, Betty Moore of England for the final. Although the official result, uh, McIntosh, New Zealand, the winner, given the same time as Betty Moore in second place, and Evans of Australia third. Now we come to the next heat. The lineup from the far side in lane one, Pat Nutting of England in lane two, and Packer, England, lane three, Mayor of Jamaica, lane four, Kilbornis, Australia, lane five, Dalton, Rhodesia, and on the near side in lane six, Chinnery of Ghana. The first three qualify for the final. The two English girls on the far side, Pat Nutting in lane one, and Packer lane two. Kilbourne got a beautiful start for Australia, so did Pat Nutting on the far side. It's Nutting and Kilbourne, with Kilbourne taking the lead now. Kilbourne nearest the camera, Nutting in second place, and Packer third. We could have two English girls first. First, was Kilbourne, Second, Pat Nutting, and third, quite a surprise, the uh, English sprinter Ann Packer running in an event which we don't normally see her, but qualifying now for the final. First, Kilbourne, Australia. Second, Nutting, England. And third, Ann Packer, England. So there are three English girls in the final. All eyes now on the arena entrance as we await the winner of the marathon. Will it be Brian Kilby, number seven? Will it be Dave Parr of Australia, number three? The holdout is Brian Kilby. Kilby, the European champion, the three A's champion, coming home about 100 yards to go on the track to take England's fourth gold medal on this fantastic day. The weather came cool today. The weather came good, as the Australians say, for English runners. And here's Brian Kilby. very tired, it's been a desperately hard race because all the leading boats have been right together and Kilby takes the gold medal. Kilby, 24 years old, comparative youngster in marathon running, 24 years old, a member of Cotton Drinker Diver Harriers. This is only about his eighth marathon. He's only ever been beaten once and that was in the Rome Olympics. A really supreme marathon runner. Ryan Kilby, three A's champion, European champion, and now the Empire champion, being congratulated by Les Gelding, his team manager, or the English team manager, and here in second place, it looks like Dave Carr of Australia. Carr, the holder of the man who won two gold medals in Cardiff four years ago, the six miles in the marathon, now has to be content with second place here in Australia, and the silver medal for the marathon. Ah, look, 
a little stronger now than Kilby, but Kilby had clearly done his running where it mattered, out in the country. Well, now here is Brian Kilby, the winner of the marathon. Well done, Brian. Thanks very much. Was it a pleasant trip for you? Uh, well, just as pleasant as you could expect for a marathon anyway, you know. Of course, the weather changing for you made a big difference, didn't it? Oh, yes, a big difference. I think it uh, helped us morally and, you know, physically as well. Now, what was the story of the race? Where did you actually go ahead? Well, I think uh, it must have been between 15 and 16, I'm quite sure, but uh, I made a s just a short break and then Power came with me. Just before 16, I went in front again and uh, more or less stayed there from then on, you know, just increased the to about something like 150 yards, I think. So, in fact, you were ahead for the last 10 miles? Uh, well, yes, more or less. Yes. Did you have a really bad patch anywhere? Uh, no, I went a little tired, just about 23, but uh, came through again, you know, as we got towards the stadium, like. I must say, you look very fresh. Oh, that's just the way it is when you win, isn't it? Yeah. Well, now you've got the uh, European, you've got the Empire. Just the Olympic one left, Brian. Uh, yeah, well, that's a long time off. We'll have to wait and see how it goes. Well, well, I'll work in the meantime. Uh, should, yes, I should think all, so. All right, well, I know they want you for the victory ceremony. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Martin Lucking in the Shotford Circle. He's leading in the competition at the moment with a putt of 59 feet 4 inches. That one was a foul throw. But there's only one round left now in the shot. And it looks as if Martin Lucking, the doctor from South End, has got a very good chance of taking the gold medal. Uh, just behind the uh, shot put circle, the start of the women's 220 yards, uh, Mike. Uh, Martin Lucking still leading in the shot with Mike Lindsay of Scotland in second place. Another home gold medal hope here in Dorothy Hyman in lane three. On the inside at Burville, Australia, lane two, Bennett, Australia. Lane three, Hyman, England. Lane four, Cox, Australia. Lane five, the world record holder, Betty Cuthbert, who got a beautiful start on the outside. Doreen Porter, the New Zealand champion. Cuthbert, the world record holder, leading as they come off the bend, but she has been fading before she's starting well. And Dorothy Hyman's trading at the moment in fourth place. Let's see how Dorothy goes down the straight. It's going to be a tremendous finish. And here comes Hyman. Dorothy Hyman coming right away, but fighting hard on the inside of her is Joyce Bennett. And Dorothy Hyman's going to hold on to take her second gold medal. She's done it. Dorothy Hyman first. Second, Joyce Bennett. And third, Margaret Burville. Conditions right against Dorothy Hyman, who doesn't like wind. She's not very strong, but a superb run. Benny Cuthbert made them look a little slow around that band, but Dorothy Hyman was always going well, and when she hit the straight, she fairly flew to take the second gold medal of the Games for the Yorkshire girl. that uh, race again in slow motion. Dorothy Hyman, remember, in lane three. On the inside is uh, Burville, Australia. Lane two, Bennett, Australia. Lane three, Hyman, England. Lane four, Cox, Australia. Lane five, Cuthbert, Australia. Lane six, uh, Doreen Porter, New Zealand. And just look at Betty Cuthbert, the world record holder in lane five. The blonde Betty Cuthbert, a beautiful start, really streaking away, but she has been fading in the previous rounds as she hit the straight. Dorothy Hyman going very well indeed in lane uh, three. Hyman in the all-white kit for England. Running smoothly and beautifully, really streaking away down the straight as she comes into the wind. Dorothy Hyman very determined, full of courage, full of fight, and beautifully balanced. The presentation of medals for the 220 yards women's final. The winner, Dorothy Hyman, receiving the gold medal from Sandy Duncan, the secretary of the Federation. Dorothy's time was 23.8 seconds, extremely good in this win. Second place, a local girl from West Australia, Joyce Bennett, 24.2. And third, another girl from West Australia, with a lot of local support, Margaret Burville, 24.5. The final of the 120 yards hurdles from the far side in lane one, uh, Bob Birrell, England. Lane two, Dave Prince, Australia. Lane three, Mike Dawes, Australia. Lane four, Laurie Tate of England. Lane five, Mick Devlin, Australia. Nearest the camera in lane six, Razik of Pakistan. Beautiful start there. Bob Birrell got away very well, and so did uh, Dawes in the centre. But going well on the near side is Razik. Razik leading now from Tate of England. The race between the two of them, and Tate's hurting beautifully. And so too, in lane two, is Dave Print. And Tate failed there. He hit one very badly, but it's Razik Pakistan first. Second was Dave Prince of Australia, and third, Laurie Tate, who appeared in the middle of the race to be in a winning position, but uh, struck a hurdle very heavily indeed. And on this grey, rather cold and windy day, rainy as well, the English athletes really, really coming back to form. England's second gold medal of the afternoon already after only three events. Um, a gold medal in the shot for Martin Lucking.
59 feet 4 inches. And in second place taking the silver, Mike Lindsay Scotland, 59 feet 2 and a half inches. And third for Canada, Dave Steen, 58 feet 8 and 3 quarter inches. The first heat of the mile, and in this we have three sub four minute milers. The world record holder, the man in black, Peter Snell, Bruce Tello of England, and Albie Thomas right on the inside of Australia. It's going to be a pretty warm heat, this one, also in the races. Alan Simpson, currently our number one miler at home. Only three qualify. And straight into the lead goes the runner from North Borneo, Claire. And right at the back, just look at Peter Snell. Snell starting in a most leisurely way, the world record holder. Obviously not bothered by the way that uh, Claire and Borneo shot off in front. In second place is Khan of Pakistan. Third, in love Lou of uh, Rhodesia. Just going up third now is Albie Thomas. Uh, fifth, Victoria of Canada. Sixth is uh, Tullo and Simpson going up on the outside. Snell still trailing away at the back, taking life very easily. Of course, Peter Snell won't want a hard run anyway. He's only run two competitive miles this year, one in the 420s and one in the 430s. It's right at the beginning of the season for him, but obviously, by his running in the 880 yards two days ago, he showed that he's very much in his best form. Bruce Tullow just moving up fourth, so the order at the end of the first lap is Claire of North Borneo, Khan of Pakistan, Albie Thomas just going up second, Tullow is fourth now, but Toya fifth. And Snell still at the bank, but just moving gradually through. The time for the first lap was 61.6. Albie Thomas leading. He's done a 358.8 mile. Very disappointed that he didn't run better in the three miles. But now, out to produce something in the mile. Bruce Tello in second place, equally disappointed with his running in the three miles. Thomas leading, Tello second, Kaino of Kenya in third place, fourth, Khan of Pakistan, fifth, Alan Simpson of England, sixth, the powerful Peter Snell of New Zealand, seventh, Victoria of Canada, eighth, in Lovelu of Rhodesia, ninth, Khan, and tenth is Griffith. Half a mile gone. Thomas really putting on the pace in front. Two minutes, three seconds, a slightly slower lap than the first lap. Tello just having a look back to make sure what kind of gap there is behind. Kaino is in uh, third place. Snell making a move now, not to allow the gap to develop too much. Just look at Snell going down that back straight. Just spurred it easily. Alan Simpson in fifth place. He's going to have to do some work if he's going to keep in touch with the leaders. Remember, the first three qualify. Thomas, Australia leading. Tullo, England in second place. Kaino of Kenya third. Snell, New Zealand fourth. Simpson, England fifth. The race between the five of them. Coming up to the bell, Tullo has run a much more confident race in this uh, mile lead. And Alvin Thomas looks like he's laboring a little bit there. Tullo leading, Thomas second. Kaino of Kenya third, Snell fourth, and Alan Simpson fifth. And Simpson's got an awful lot to do if he's going to qualify in the first three. Tullo leading, Thomas second, Kaino third, Snell fourth, Simpson fifth. Tullo just looking around, doesn't want to do any more than he's got to do to qualify, but he doesn't ease up too much. Albie Thomas going in front. Tullo second, Snell third, Simpson fourth, Kaino fifth. And Kaino looks if like he's beaten from Kenya, and Simpson could well be run out of this one. Snell now making his move. And most impressive he looks too, he really run quite beautifully. Alan Simpson will have to go very hard indeed down the straight to qualify, be between the two English boys. Snell and Thomas qualifying easily. Tullo having to fight with Simpson, and it looks as like if Simpson's not going to qualify. Thomas first, Snell second, Tullo third, and Simpson currently England's number one miler out of the final. On the javelin runway is Rosemary Morgan of England in the lead in the women's javelin at the moment, rather surprisingly.
Well, that's not as good as her best throw, but Rosemary Morgan is still leading in the competition with Susan Platt of England in second place. Susan Platt on the runway for England and the Javelin in second place at the moment behind Rosemary Morgan. And that one could just about put her in the lead. It's desperately close alongside uh, Rosemary Morgan's marker, Rosemary Morgan number five. The javelin's broken there, but that will make no difference. In fact, that's uh, Susan's Platt, Susan Platt's best throw. And that could well be the gold medal throw. And Susan Platt, as you can see, did take the gold medal. Susan Platt, Platt 22 years old from Mill Hill, with a throw of 164 feet, 10 and a half inches. Second, also from England, Rosemary Morgan for the silver, 162 feet, 9 and a half. And third, the Australian, Anna Pizzera, 159 feet, 8 and a half inches. A wonderful day for England. That's England's third gold medal so far. Robbie Brightwell, the European 400 metres champion, waiting to be called to his mark for the start of the first semi-final in the 400 metres. The lineup from the inside, Barry Robinson of New Zealand. In lane two, Mal Spence, Jamaica. Lane three, Addy of Ghana. Lane four, Brightwell, England. Lane five, Sangok of Kenya, who got the silver medal in the 440 hurdles. And on the outside, Roach of Australia, the man who got the gold medal in the 440 hurdles. The first three go through into the final. Brightwell, who's been troubled uh, with a tummy upset for the past couple of days. Everyone's hoping he's fully fit again, though. He got a beautiful start. He really came right off the block like a sprinter. Right well, really turning away around that first bend and going very well on the outside, too, for Australia is Roach. But certainly, Brightwell's cut right back on the Kenyan Songok. Also going well is Mal Spencer of Jamaica in lane two, and so now is Addy of Ghana. A very strong wind blowing. It'll hit the runners as they go into this bend. Roach of Australia way out in front on the outside. Brightwell, England. What a beautiful mover Brightwell is. Re really majestic runner. Brightwell coasting around the corner. He comes into the straight. He's done his running already, and he's just got to hold his place now to qualify. The first three go through. Brightwell on the near side and the is Roach of Australia. And is Brightwell going to win with Spence tying up badly in second place? Brightwell first, Spence second, Roach third, and those three go through into the final. Their confirmation of the placings in that semi-final. Brightwell 47.4. Spence second and Roach third. And now for the second semi-final. Uh, Barry Jackson is the English runner in the second semi-final of the 440 yards. Jackson running in lane one. Interesting to see how he goes because he's got slightly strained uh, ligaments. In lane two, Crothers of Canada. Lane three, the great George Carr of Jamaica. Lane four, Mel Spence of Jamaica. Lane five, Amolo Uganda. And lane six, right on the outside, Waters Australia. And. Spence has gone off at a tremendous rate, and so too is Waters right on the outside. Waters really streaking into a long lead. He's obviously taken a few yards off of Molo of Uganda in lane five. And moving up now on the inside in lane one, Barry Jackson, who's showing no signs at all of the leg trouble he's been suffering from. Waters in a long lead on the outside, but one feels that he must fade a little bit as he comes into the wind. In second place at the moment is Spence. With, uh, George Carr coming through very quickly too, and Jackson laboring slightly on the inside. He seems to be training his left leg a little bit. George Carr, Jamaica, coming, storming through in the centre, and on the near side of Molo of Uganda, and Jackson may have just been run out of the final. It's going to be very close, but he's storming through on the inside. His leg's gone. Jackson's leg's gone. With about 10 yards to go, George Carr was first, and Molo Uganda second, and Spence of Jamaica third. Let's just take a look at Jackson again, because this is rather a disaster, not only from the point of view of this individual race, but Jackson is a key man in our relay team, favourites to take the gold medal on the final day on Saturday, and it rather looks as if Jackson won't be able to run at all. He was warned by the doctor and the master before the start of this race that he really ought to run. He took the risk, and this is the result. The next event is the 440 yards final, and it brings together two of the finest quarter milers in the world today, running right on the outside, wearing number eight for England, Robbie Brightwell, the three A's champion, the reigning European champion, and facing today the greatest test of his career. 22 years old, a member of Birchfield Harriers, uh, 12 and a half stone, six foot two inches tall, a really fine athlete. Now let's come back and see his great rival. 
makers, George Carr, drawn in lane two, wearing number 17. He was the silver medalist in the 880 yards. Well, now to go through the full field. On the inside, Mal Spence, Jamaica. Lane two, George Carr, Jamaica. Lane three, Ken Roach, Australia. Lane four, Amolo, Uganda. Lane five, Mel Spence, Jamaica. On the outside, Brightwell of England. Let's just watch Brightwell start. And he got away beautifully. It was a really good start by Brightwell. Already taking a yard off Mel Spence inside him, but Mel Spence going up very fast. Right well drawn in the worst position, right on the outside. Of course, George Carr, his great rival in lane two, can see him all the way. But Brightwell's gone off very fast indeed, and so too has Mel Spence in lane five. Brightwell is certainly leading. Mel Spence in second place, and George Carr cutting down the gap in lane two. Carr's the man to watch in lane two. Brightwell on the outside, Mel Spence next to the outside. Off the bend, into the wind. Brightwell just slightly ahead, but George Carr coming very fast in lane two, and Brightwell's got a lot to do. He's about two yards down. George Carr on the inside, Brightwell on the outside, Brightwell took a look at him and kicks, and Amolo, Uganda, coming through in the middle. This is really going to be a finish. Carr on the far side, Brightwell tying up, and it looks like George Carr's just got it. George Carr first. Amolo may just have taken the silver from an absolutely tired out Robbie Brightwell. Drawn in the worst position right on the outside, he had to go all the way, and he ran himself right out. Brightwell has not been very well. In fact, he's been uh, sick for the past few days with some stomach trouble, but really gave everything in that run. And I'm afraid he just was picked for the silver medal. It looks as if Omolo got up. To George Carr, the winner for Jamaica. In second place, I think, Omolo. And third, Robbie Brightwell. Well, Brightwell's desperate dive paid off. He did get the silver medal, given the same time as Amolo. The official result, George Carr, Jamaica first, 46.7. Second, Robbie Brightwell of England, 46.8. And third, this complete novice from Uganda, only his third quarter mile race ever, Amolo, 46.8. Now, away from athletics, for a look at England's world champion weightlifter, Lewis Martin, in action. It's the final of the middle heavyweight division. The Jamaican-born electrician, who now lives in Derby, is in a class of his own. In two lifts and the snatch and jerk, Martin's already moved a total of 695 pounds. Now he's preparing for his last effort. On the bar, he's got another 340 pounds, and that's the equivalent of a 12-stone man on each end. He's done it, a total of 1,035 pounds, a game's record, and 12 pounds of his own world record. Another convincing win for England. Almost frightening, that wasn't it? Now, an apology we have to make. I said Brian Kilby was the only man to have done the marathon double. Well, of course, he isn't. He's the only man since Jack Holden did it. And now the final game medal placings were like this. Australia, 38 gold, 36 silver, 31 bronze. England, 29 gold, 22 silver, 27 bronze. New Zealand, 10 gold, 12 silver, 10 bronze. And the placings for the other home countries, Scotland, 4 gold, 7 silver, 3 bronze. Wales, 2 silver, 4 bronze. And Northern Ireland, 1 bronze. The first athletes to arrive back in England from the Empire Games arrived at London Airport tonight. They were the oarsmen, John Beveridge, Michael Clay, Nicholas Berkmeyer and George Justice. Berkmeyer and Justice won gold medals in the double skulls and Beveridge and Clay got a gold in the coxless fours and a bronze in the eights. Now our next Empire Games report is on Tuesday at 10.25 when we shall be bringing you all the highlights of today's big athletic events. Now, racing today was hit by the fog, which caused the Catterick meeting to be abandoned. The Windsor meeting began 25 minutes late, but the big race of the meeting, the Royal Lodge Chase, provided an exciting finish, and Peter Montague Evans is our commentator. Connie, Hedgens, and Nasserling, these three are in the lead. They've got three more fences still to be jumped, and it's Connie from... Hedgelands and Nasseling, Connie the second, jumping well, still in the lead, she'd been there right from the start. Connie the second from Hedgelands and Nasseling, these three seem to be well clear of Out of Town and Gay Record. And it's still Connie the second over on the inside with Hedgelands in second place. Two more fences still to jump now, Connie in the lead from Hedgelands and Nasseling, they come now to the second last. 
Connie over first, heads into second race, and Nasseling, Nasseling has fallen, that second last fence, Natalie's Connie now in the lead still from Hedgens, these two well clear of out of town and Sterling Bridge rather than third place. Only one more fence to be jumped. It's Connie the second in the lead, being very strongly pressed by Hedgens. These two well clear of the rest of the runners. Coming up now, this final fence, a great fish is going to be at the end of this three mile journey. Connie the second and Hedgens. Connie over first, Hedgens the second place. Still Connie just the advantage. Hedgens trying to challenge on the far side. It's Connie on the left of the picture now, just the lead from Hedgens to the well clear of Gay Record at the post now. It's Connie still in the lead. It's Connie the second, the winner from Hedgens with Gay record in third place and kill more. We have a lot of leg ground, ran a great race to be fourth. The winner And the official result, Conin the second, seven to one, Hedgelands five to two, gay record ten to one. Finally, it's back to football and a visit to the Midlands. Wolves began the season in tremendous style, but recently they slumped badly. Not so Leicester City. They're playing fine football at the moment, and they're only four points behind the leaders. Wally Barnes reports on this all Midlands clash, Wolves against Leicester City. There is the Wolverhampton side in this first division game here at Molyneux this afternoon. They've only won one of their last eight league fixtures, and that was last Saturday against Lake Norrent. And one wonders whether it's the introduction of Slater, number five at centre half, that has brought this solidarity about the Wolves side at last. There's the visiting side this afternoon. Leicester City, only 23 goals against them this season so far and this I think undoubtedly due to the half-back line of McLintock, King and Appleton and a very very workmanlike wing half-back line it is too. Wolverhampton Wanderers then to kick off in this first division game here at Molyneux. The pitch absolutely ideal for football, the light very good and uh, already the ball, the referee Mr Faulkner said the ball must go forward into the opponent's half and it must roll its full circumference before anybody else plays it. So off we go again with the start. Wolverhampton kicking off. In their traditional colours, of course. All golden black shorts. Leicester City in the white shorts and blue jerseys. Flowers, the skipper of the Wolverhampton side. After a successful game for England on Thursday. English league side, rather. Broadway. to Hinton. Hinton, and that's a bad pass by Hinton. Stobart can never get up on that. Didn't even have got up on it, that's what would have happened. It's a corner kick to Wolves. Hinton's corner kick for Wolves coming over. Full down by Crow, but he can't quite get back to it. A Banks now for Leicester to Riley. Appleton to Walsh. <coughs> Cheeseborough banging along one across there to Gibson. Gibson to Riley. Riley cutting it in first time. This must be the first one. There it is. It's Gibson. Well, they say that Leicester City forward line doesn't kick very well, but they certainly whip the ball in the back of the net there before any Wolves player could move. So after 18 minutes, we have Leicester City going ahead by one goal to nil. And a very well taken goal by Gibson, their inside right in the bargain. Wolves kicking off, one down. Flowers calling for Hinton to come towards him and not run away. Undoubtedly will set the game alight. Hinton now. To Walton. Walton completely miss missing the ball altogether, but it turns it into to a good one because uh, Crow trying to jink his way past uh, Norman does get past, floated into the centre there, Banks, and this must be a goal. Hinton's much too slow getting to it. Tries a shot, this is his left footed shot. Oh, he just doesn't get it again. Now, that's possibly the Lack of experience on young Hinton's part. He really should have run onto that with his right foot and clattered it first time. Some eight minutes before the end, end of uh, the first half, with Leicester leading by one goal to nil. It changes ends rapidly and it's in the own goal! It's hit. Flowers! So concerned with stopping Walsh getting the ball from that Floated centre by Keyworth, and that's what it was. He floated it across to beat him. 
players has put it into his own goal some seven and a half minutes before the end of the first half. So Wolves now trail by two goals to nil. And the scorer, Flyers, the captain and left half of Wolverhampton side. Flyers now. They get on to Crow. by Wharton, nodded out by Keyworth. Teesborough. Leicester now beginning to open up this Wolverhampton defence with some well-flighted crossfield passing, which of course is normal of the Wolverhampton side. They normally play this uh, crossfield pass. In the meantime, of course, we have this little bit of business going on, and there you can see how silly it is for players to interfere when the goalkeeper is being charged fairly by the opposition because Chalmers has made a silly mistake there. He's given an indirect free kick away. It's naturally, being inside the penalty would be indirect. Maybe a good lesson to be learned there by young people that not to come charging people in the back or attempting to interfere with them when they are challenging the goalkeeper. Indirect free kick then. Well, Wolverhampton Wanderers, Broadbent saying that Gibson is nearer than 10 yards and he's not nearer than 10 yards and it's Flowers taking that uh, push pass corner kick to uh, Wolves and the two Leicester fullbacks, Chalmers and Norman are coming in a little bit keenly to say the least in their tackling after the stoppage of play for an entry to McLintock. Walsh onto Riley. Riley now having to go a little bit on his own. There's nobody up with him. Oh, and Walsh there. So busy watching whether Flowers is going to catch him in the tackle. Took his eye off the ball. And that's a throw in for Wolves. Flowers back to Thompson. Oh, and a pathetic clearance there by Flowers gives a throw in to Leicester and I would make it some four minutes left to play now in the first half with Leicester leading by two goals to nil as it comes to McLintock and that's out of play throw in to Wolves Flowers taking the throw Thompson he was getting it on to Gibson. Gibson playing it first time as he'd hoped for Riley to have gone on to, but Riley hadn't anticipated that at all. Thompson's pass collected and kicked clear by Davies. Nodded on by Stobart. King just bangs it away first time to Gibson. Appleton having to check there for Cheeseborough to come with him. Appleton fighting a long one through to Gibson. He's onside. This must be the third one. And a wonderful effort there by Gibson. What a brilliant little player he's proved to be this afternoon against the Wolverhampton side. Gibson then, who scored the first after 18 minutes, has scored Leicester's third goal. Some three minutes before the end of the first half, 43 minutes after the game started, Leicester are now leading by three goals to nil to kick off in the second half with the two Leicester fullbacks, Chalmers and Norman are coming in a little bit keenly to say the least in their tackling. Banks after the stoppage of play for an entry to McLintock. Walsh onto Riley. Riley now having to go a little bit on his own. There's nobody up with him. Oh, and Walsh there. So busy watching whether Flowers is going to catch him in the tackle. Took his eye off the ball. And that's a throw in for Wolves. Flowers back to Thompson. Oh, and a pathetic clearance there by Flowers. Gives a throw in to Leicester. And I would make it some four minutes left for play now in the first half with 
Leicester leading by two goals to nil as it comes to McLintock. And that's out of play. Throw in to Wolves. Flowers taking the throne. Thompson. He was getting it on to Gibson. Gibson playing it first time as he'd hoped for Riley to have gone on to, but Riley hadn't anticipated that at all. Thompson's pass collected and kicked clear by Davies. Not it on by Stobart. King just bangs it away first time to Gibson. Appleton having to check there for Cheeseborough to come with him. Appleton fighting a long one through to Gibson. He's onside. This must be the third one. And a wonderful effort there by Gibson. What a brilliant little player he's proved to be this afternoon against the Wolverhampton side. Gibson, then, who scored the first after 18 minutes, has scored Leicester's third goal some three minutes before the end of the first half. 43 minutes after the game started, Leicester are now leading by three goals to nil to kick off in the second half with the floodlights on now which will probably a little bit more light on the scene certainly may help the Wolves because they're trailing by three goals nil having played some very inept football in the first half Leicester on the other hand who are accused of being rather negative in the forward line played remarkably well they have pulled or beginning to pull Keyworth back from centre forward to make sure that they keep this three goal advantage that they've got Crow. Oh, they're back against Crow. You could probably see him all but making a rugby tackle on Walsh. He was just getting away from him. Appleton. To Riley trying to go around Thompson. Thompson. And there's a foul against Riley for pulling very much the same way that Crow pulled Walsh back. Davies having to kick against a slight wind in the second half, but it doesn't seem to make much difference to the distance that he gets it down the pitch. Not enough by Stobart to Walton. Bank fast. Quickly to uh, leave any problems there. He was nodding it on. Turkham to Flowers. Turkham Shoal too late there. That's the first full-blooded tackle that we've seen by any Wolves player since the start of the game. Now, the one by Scholl, but it's a throw-in to Leicester. Appleton to King to Norman. And Broadbent getting it out to Hinton. Inside, nodded away by Appleton. Thompson, again, this in it passing by the Wolves defenders, particularly. Broadbent showing a little bit of challenge, turning it upfield to Wharton. Wharton, oh, Banks is quite happy to look after those all the afternoon. What's left of it as far as the game is concerned. It's about 42 minutes left for play. In other words, three minutes gone in the second half. A long raking one there by Cheeseborough is collected quite easily by Davis. Davies rather. Comes up to walk. And already in this first three or four minutes of the first, second half, we see more effort and more challenge by the Wolverhampton side than shown in all the first half put together. Keyworth trying to back either to Riley, only finds Thompson as Broadbent. To Hinton. Uh, 
reason for that uh, free kick is the fact that Chalmers was taking the long Hinton's left leg with him. So we've got Hinton whacking it in very hard and he's coming in on again. And there's the Hinton's famous left foot there to stop that into the near post. Since I'm arguing that Crow fouled him, but uh, Wolves back in the picture by Hinton, their outside left after four minutes play in the second half. The score now, Wolves one, Leicester City three. 3-1 for Leicester, who go marching on as Wolves go slipping downwards. George Farm, the former Blackpool goalkeeper, now the Queen of the South player manager, who was carried off the field soon after the start of the match at Dundee this afternoon, was detained for the night in Dundee Royal Infirmary with concussion. He was hurt in a collision with Alan Gelzine, the Dundee inside left, who went on to score seven goals in his side's 10-2 victory. Huddersfield Town, fifth in the second division, lost 2-1 at Stoke, and bang went their unbeaten away record. Now, Arsenal's 4-2 win at Manchester City this afternoon was their first success outside London this season. Their other victories have been at Lake Orient and at Fulham. Three hat-tricks today. Alan Peacock, the Middlesbrough and England centre-forward, got one in his size 4-3 win at Charlton, after which the crowd stormed the Charlton offices shouting, We want Leary. Chris Riley of Crew Alexandra got one in their 5-1 away victory. And Dave Hickson of Tranmere Rovers, yes, the famous Dave Hickson of Everton days, got one in Tranmere Rovers victory. So, three hat-tricks. And there we end Saturday Sport for another week. But we'll be with you again a week from today and look forward to having you join us. Till then, from all of us, good night. This is BBC Television.